Hey guys, so welcome back. Well, we've reached, I believe, the last episode for what we're going to have on this uh, 1953 Chevrolet tube type car radio. Uh, this will be a, a couple of a couple of topics that I want to cover, and then we're going to go through a demonstration of how this thing is working away from the house and away from all the electronics. Okay, so hopefully we can get through all that today. I believe we will. I think this will be a short episode. I just want to check a couple of things. One of them was is that this circuit that we've been looking at, right, it has a sensitivity control and it talks about it here just very briefly. Varies with sensitivity control settings. It's that little telephone pole looking thing. I'm sure it's called a dagger of some kind. Well, they're talking about this voltage on this cathode for the IF tube and if you look, there's a variable resistor here on the cathode uh, resistor for the IF tube. So this is a variable bias for this tube and they're saying that normally 0.75 volts but so basically this is not let me show you the other the schematic actually has the right voltages for this radio but it's not I don't think it's as clear as the other one is for the video but this one shows that it's uh, 1.5 volts for a grid of 0 volts so you can see the grid is just slightly more negative than the cathode Anyway, so that's that's set bias the way it ought to be, right? So anyway, this is a little easier to see. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this uh, variable cathode resistor, the sensitivity control on here. And so what it basically does by adjusting the bias on this is that affects the gain of what's going on in this amplifier. And so since they're calling it a sensitivity control, I believe what they're doing here is they're saying let's Let's adjust it to where you can adjust the gain of weak signals to get through this, okay? And uh, what I've done is I've done some messing around with this. I've tried different uh, positions. I've set this on stations. I've set between stations, and I've adjusted this control up and down. And you can hear, first of all, on strong stations, I couldn't tell any difference. On in-between stations only, I could hear a little bit of difference in terms of the, the, the noise that's there, just a small amount of difference in the game. But, you know, basically I think what you would do is, is that, you know, in a city or something like that, you might not be so interested in noise between stations because you have so many to pick from. Noise between stations might be considered a nuisance. But if you're in a rural setting, you know, you might be trying to pick up some of those weaker stations. And since the owner of this radio is in a rural area, I want to set this to be as, as sensitive as we can. So as I say, I think what we'd like to have is we want to have the maximum sensitivity of this for the user for his application. So what that does is is that in between stations we're going to have noise, okay? And the AVC is going to kind of apparently boost that noise. But like I say, I mean you might be able then be able to get in and pick out little far away stations. And like I say, if you're in a rural setting, that might be really desirable. Okay. So what we want to do though is make sure that when we do this, we're not over biasing this. We're not running this tube too hot. Okay. So what I'd like to do is, is come up with a way to check the the plate current, you know, and the plate voltage, and that'll give us the dissipation power of this IF tube, all right, from the plate. And uh, so what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a method that I saw Uncle Doug show, which is uh, really good, and uh, I'll show that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and determine what the the plate current is. We'll be able to do that by looking at the voltage drop or whatever you want to say, uh, increase I guess you might say, uh, across the resistor that's here and that'll give us what the current is going in through the cathode. Uh, we can also check, you know, we need to check the resistor so we know what that is. So once we know the voltage and the resistance we'll be able to get the current and then we'll measure the voltage on the plate and then we'll know what the uh, the plate uh, uh, power distribution is, or power dissipation is, and we'll compare that against the uh, manual. So we'll get into that. And just so you remember, that resistor is right here. Okay, so it actually moves pretty easily. And it's a wire wound resistor. And you see, you just turn it a little bit here. So I currently have it set fully clockwise, which is the minimum resistance on that. So what we're going to do is we'll turn this back around and we're going to work from the other side 
and this is the IF tube right here. All right. So to measure the uh, resistance across that, power is off. So we're going to go in and measure resistance <coughs> between, I can pick it up here, there, and we'll pick it up to ground. Okay, now I'm going to turn that so you can see how it affects the resistance. Counterclockwise, so the resistance is going up. I'm going to go back down, and I've got it pretty much at minimal resistance there. Okay, so I've let this all come up to uh, voltage, and it's stabilized quite well. And so what I'm going to do is just go in and make the measurements, so that we can determine what the plate dissipation is at the setting I have it at. Okay, so. Uh, I've got the voltage turned up all the way, no signal coming in. I pulled the antenna off station. Okay, so let's let's go through and we'll go through this step together. What we're going to do is we're going to measure the plate voltage first. So I'll come in and take meter and we'll say, okay, the plate, this is the IF tube here. So I'm going to go to the ground and the plate is right here. Okay, let's let this stabilize and that'll be our plate voltage of the IF tube. Okay, so the plate voltage is 209, 210. We'll go conservative, so we'll say 210. 210 volts, okay? Now what I want to do is measure the voltage across the cathode capa uh, resistor, which is right here. Okay, that is going to be measuring the voltage across this resistor right here. I'm measuring it to the cathode to ground. And that's R53. Oh, wait a we're measuring voltage right now. So this is V at the cathode. Tweak our voltage there. Well, I won't I won't touch it. Alright, so our voltage is one point one four. Three volts. Okay, now I'm going to turn the system off. All right, now what we're going to do is watch the caps drain off. What we're going to do is measure the resistance across that same resistor. So the resistor 53, let's let this stabilize. 125 point, 125.6. 125.6 ohms, right? Okay, so let's figure out what our plate dissipation is of the uh, IF tube. All right, so we want to find the current. So V equals IR, right? You see that? I can't tell if you can see that or not. So V equals IR, and we want to solve for I. All right, so I is going to equal V divided by R, right? And that's going to be equal to the voltage of the cathode, which is 1.143, right, because we want to know the current going through 53, 
divided by the resistance, which is 125.6 ohms. Right. So our current is going to be 1.143, 1 1.143, right? Uh, divided by 125.6, about 9 milliamps. Okay. Right. So now to figure out the uh, the power dissipation at the plate, well, power is equal to VI, right, or I squared R. So then we can say, well, then the voltage is 210 volts times the current, which is 0 0.009 amps, and this will be the dissipation power. Plate dissipation. So 210 times 0 0.009 is 1.89 watts. All right, is 1.89 watts. All right, let's pull out the manual and see what we're allowed to have on the 6BA6. Okay, 6BA6, this is which, man, which version of this I'm using, whatever year this is. Anyway, 6BA6, and we come over here, and it's being run as a Class A amplifier, and these are the maximum ratings. So this isn't just sign center, but it is also absolute max. So we've got a little bit of safety factor here. Here's plate dissipation. Okay. And plate dissipation is allowed to be 3.4 max watts. And we are at 1.9. Okay. So we've got a good safety factor there. So we've got this bias to where it's not running too hot. And we've got amplification, but we're not going to go into uh, running that tube too hot or getting any clipping or anything like that. So I think we're in pretty good shape there. So when I order the tubes, for this radio. They came as a set of complete set of tubes for this radio. And when I got them, the uh, the cardboard sleeve for the rectifier had written in ink on the side, solid state. The eBay listing didn't say anything about that. Um, so what I did was I tested this between pin 8 and 3 and 5 and sure enough it showed diodes in here so uh, I've done a, num a lot of testing in here since then and satisfied myself the voltage in the unit is okay I've done research on this and of course you know it's been done for decades and they seems to work just fine there is seems to be a lot of talk about whether or not there should be resistors put in here as well just in case a diode goes bad um, so I've decided I'm going to open this thing up and see how did the guy do this? Uh, so I'm going to do that now. Okay. So the index is pointing to the right side of the 0Z4 zero um, zero indicator. Okay. No resistor. Okay, so what we got is we've got a couple of diodes here one in four double o sevens yeah so now you can see they're, they're one in four double o sevens cathode goes to pin eight correct All right it's pin eight and then i believe it's three and five let's see one two th yeah three and five go to the transformer All right let me let me work on this Okay, I've got some uh, 220 ohm 2 watt resistors, just what I have. I'm going to uh, try putting these things in and we'll check how the voltages perform.
Okay, I've got the uh, resistor set to be soldered into place. And uh, do that real quick, and then we'll see what the voltages do. That looks good. So, okay, now our solid state rectifier has got a couple of uh, 220 ohm resistors in here. I want to do some voltage checks. I did the loop method on here in case I needed to uh, change the resistors. It will slip off the diodes. Otherwise, they're on there mechanically pinched on just fine. Okay. Question should I put the shield on? I guess I will, just lightly, and then we'll see how this thing performs. Okay, we said the index was going to be just to the right of this. Correct. That's not hitting anything. Hope if I could do it this way instead. Yeah. Let's see, that's not touching anything. I will secure this better later after I've got the thing tested. Okay, I've got the uh, solid state rectifier in there with the two resistors that we added. Uh, I've had it running for just a few minutes. I'm going to let it run for quite a while, but just see how we stand right now. Uh, we've got six volts going in. We're running at five and a half amps. That's of the DC going in. I'm then measuring the output of the rectifier before it goes to the first set of filter capacitors. I'm at 251 volts DC. Okay. And this is the correct schematic for this radio. It's got the, the right AVC values in here. If we look at the output of the rectifier, then that's 250 volts, plus or minus 10 percent, and we're right on it. So, looks like the 220 ohm resistors are going to be just fine for this. Like I say, I'm going to let this run for a while to make sure it's all okay, but I think it's going to be alright. So I've got it off station, I've got volume turned up all the way, turn the volume back down, hook up the antenna, Get in there. Okay. To the station. And delivery is immediate and free within the Houston area. Stop by one of the three Correct Houston the locations or visit their website, thepinebox.com, or call Chip directly at 1 888 Pine Box. That's 1 888 Pine Box. I trusted them, and you can. The Pine Box. Catch Chris X Radio weekdays at 4, right here on AM 700 and still, KSEV. And we're still within range here. It would be 250 to 275 for plus or minus 10%. All right, I'm going to let it play for a while and we'll see how it does. Yeah, so I'm real happy with this modification I did to the solid state rectifier that uh, this fellow sent us, uh, adding those two resistors in there, the two 220 ohm resistors. Uh, I really liked how the voltages worked out. Uh, I've had it playing for quite some time. I'm very satisfied with that. I think that's the way to go. Uh, in the meantime, I went back and looked at where I'd gotten the recommendation for the 220 ohms. It was on a website. I'll put a, a view up of it here. And uh, the fellow had done quite a bit of work on it and had, you know, suggested the wattage of the resistors as well. Now, I had used the 2 watt resistors because that's what I had on hand, uh, but he was recommending 3 watt and had calculated up that it was given a 100% margin on the safety factor, which I would call a 2.2 two, a two, two point, you know, two to 1 safety factor for using a 3 watt. Um, I think that, you know, you probably would be fine with 2 watts. This has certainly been fine with 2 watts. But, you know, I, I don't want to stress this. And, uh, you know, the guy did enough work on that I, I was and was right about the 220 ohms. So I, I said, well, okay, I'll get some 3 watt. So I got some 3 watt wire wounds, which were actually what he, I actually got the part number he recommended. And because I was on a roll, he also was not recommending using the the 1N4007. Not that he said I don't recommend you using it. He just recommended, you know, some fast diodes. He recommended the UH, or UF, sorry, 
uh, 400H, <laughs> I try again, UF4007 rectifiers. So these are high speed, but still a thousand volts and so forth. So I'm going to switch from the 1N4007 to these. And then uh, I'm going to also switch to these 3 watt resistors and redo this. And I'll show you what it's done, what it looks like when it's done, and then we'll put it in and we'll test it. Okay, there we can see how we did have it set up. So I'm going to change out what we have here. So you can kind of see how this was done and just kind of put them both in the same hole and soldered them in place. Okay, so I've got the uh, the new configuration set up. This is what we're going to use. So uh, these are the high speed 4007 uh, diodes. Cathodes hooked up to pin 8, correct? And then these other ones go to 3 and 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, correct? And then I've got 220 ohm wire wound resistors in here that are both 3 watts. And uh, I think this is going to be just dandy. So I'll put the cover back on and uh, I think we'll be good to go. Okay, it's all back together again, nice and tight. And uh, we'll put this thing in and we're going to test and see how it does. Okay, I've had this plan for four hours and uh, so it's gotten all stabilized. So this uh, seems to be working just great. I'm going to go through and uh, look at uh, what the voltages are. So let's do that. I'm going to get rid of the signal. Pull the signal out. Tune it off station. And we'll turn the volume up if we want to. And then we're going to correct the voltage. A little bit better control on my variac. Okay. We're just going for six volts. That's close enough. Okay, so we're at six volts, 5.4 amps. The voltage at the output of the cathode of the rectifier should be nominally 250. We're sitting at 246, 247. So that's awesome. We're well within 10% there. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to check a few more here. Let's go from this location. So let's look at the, uh, the screen voltage. We can pick that up here. It should be 205. And we're at 200. Perfect. And then we're going to go to, let's see, we can look at the plate of the output tube. It should be 235. Let's see, which one is that? That will go to, is it? This one, let's see if I can get in there. Should be 235, we're at 234. Okay, uh, let's look at the plate of the detector. Should be 110. We're at 106. We'll go to the plate of the IF, which is here. Plate of the IF should be 200 volts. Look at that, 200 volts. Oh, that's perfect. Then we'll go to the plate of the oscillator. Should be 200 volts. 200 volts. Then we'll go to the plate of the RF tube. And that should be 97. Let's see. You can pick that up here. And we're at uh, 
So it should be 97. We're at 107. I think that's okay. We're picking up some kind of signal there too. Just from the line there, I guess. And then if we go to the cathode of that, which was something we were looking at earlier. 0.57. And we think that should be 0.65, so we're good there. Okay, I think that we're in pretty good shape here with the voltages. So I'm going to say that the solid state rectifier that we got in there is working just fine. The two the uh, two resistors we added in at three watts are fine, and the uh, high speed diodes, the what were they, the UF one double O sorry four double O seven seem to be working just fine. So I think this thing is all good. I'm going to let it keep playing, but so far it looks great. Okay guys, we're about to go out and uh, give the demonstration on this radio to see how it performs, uh, how sensitive it is, and, and how it sounds when stations come in and so forth. But first what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about what all you get for the part number of this. You know, we show the radio and we say that this is the radio and this is the part number, but I think we've got to be clear about this. This part number is the part number that's on a box. When that box arrives, there's a radio in it, but there's other parts in that box too that are part of the radio itself. And you know, typically we tend to focus on the radio chassis itself, but there are other elements of this that are integral to the design of this and integral to its performance. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. So if you go, and I was talking about this the other, the other episode here, it's like the part about, you know, hey, if you let it play for 15 minutes, you'll get many months. Of interrupted service but let's look at this in a slightly broader perspective okay so when you get this part number okay you're to unpack the radio receiver and the other parts that are there check all the parts to the packing list I wish I had it okay and then if any of the items are short here's how you go back and get those parts so now as you go through here and you're and you're working on this you take the parts out you take the radio you hook it up to a power supply and let it play make sure it's doing that doing okay and here's what you do in the meantime okay some of the things you have in there are talked about here the next page install the generator condenser on the generator is shown okay so in that box there's a generator condenser I know from looking online at various places this is a 0.5 microfarad capacitor right and you have a ground connection and you have a field connection and an armature connection on a generator. A generator is basically like a brush DC motor that you run in reverse and get current out of. So that means you've got a commutator, you've got brushes, and between them, yes, you're getting sparks, okay? And those things are also like a spark gap transmitter, but then they also will be putting that interference down that line. This condenser here is there to remove that spiking, okay? And it says, do not connect it to the field terminal. So you're supposed to connect it to the uh, armature. And this one of these will have a, an F and the other will have an A stamped next to it. All right. So that's important to put in. Then the other side is, is on the voltage regulator. Okay. Install a, a capacitor on the voltage regulator. This is the side that goes to the battery, the charging line that goes to the battery. Okay. Once again, this has a set of contacts in there that are doing their thing and creating that spark which creates interference, okay? Next thing is, is it says it up here, it says put a condenser on the coil bracket. Now this is to deal with the ignition points that are within uh, the distributor. Now there's points inside the distributor and it has a condenser on there, this old guys know about it. And those are there also to help prevent with a, you know, to, light, to make the spark of the points last longer. But this is here also to prevent that noise from coming out of there and getting back into the, in the electrical circuit. Once again, you've got the condenser capacitor on there to that line that goes off. Okay. And then lastly, this is very interesting. Install the front wheel static collectors. They're only on the front wheels, which is interesting. And what it is, it's a a little clip device. I'll put a picture of it in here. I found I found a picture of some of these. Okay. Do I recall ever seeing these? I may have. I do think I may have remember seeing them maybe inside the hubs of our 63 Chevy or or our older uh, Plymouth. I'm not sure. But this is on the hub of a car. The cap comes off, and you take this 
spring steel item and you shove it down into here you clear the grease out and it's spring loaded has a button on it that sticks up and what it does is it bears on the spindle of this and apparently what it was for is that the wheels rolling down the road regenerate static electricity in dry conditions especially and that could cause interference in uh, the reception that you're getting so let me show what that you wonder you know, it's hard to find out much about this to be honest but it, there is actually more information about it in here let me see if we can find that it's in the troubleshooting okay here we go tire static I mean this is this is foreign to me okay <laughs> tire static is caused by friction between the tire and the pavement and it's almost a continuous roar while the car is in motion and does not vary appreciatively with car speed the intensity of the noise is greater on dry sunshiny days and not so noticeable on humid or rainy days well I've, I've lived in Houston thereabouts in my whole life so we've got so much humidity here maybe that's why we never noticed it um, so to eliminate tire noise be sure that the front wheel static collectors have been installed make sure they're free of grease and making good contact okay if it still persists, install tire static powder in all five tires. Well, I found a picture of what the static powder looks like. And I've read people speculating about what this is. Is it, is it graphite? Does it have aluminum particles in it? I don't know. Okay. And you'd put that in there, I guess, to prevent static. Uh, I've read where people have said, well, that has to do with prior to tubeless tires. You have a tire with an inner tube in it and you would get static electricity building up between the inner tube and the housing of the tire. I've so, seen you know, other people say, well, it has to do with the relative amount of, of silica versus carbon black in the rubber of the tire. Oh, I don't know. So anyway, I thought that was an interesting sort of thing to put in there. And then the, uh, the last part you might have where you have things going spark, spark, is the vibrator. And there's a 0.5 capacitor that we took out of the transformer and put outside of the transformer to handle what's going on there. And I know there's been some discussion about, well, maybe it needs to be in the transformer versus outside the transformer. Otherwise, why in the world would they put it in there? I'll just say that when the engineer, I mean, this is me just speculating, okay? When the engineers designed this, they weren't living in a world where they're saying, where would be the best place to put this so that I can service this in 70 years? Their, their problem that they had to solve was more nuanced than that. They also had to deal with manufacturability. And they were making a transformer that was designed specifically for use with vibrator type systems for thousands of these radios, okay? And so somebody made the decision that says, let's go ahead and take the capacitor that we're gonna need for noise suppression of the vibrator and let's just go ahead and put it in the, in the transformer rather than having another item we now have to have somebody wire up and solder. It's all taken care of. So I think that's a very likely possibility for what that is. Now, if we can find somebody that was a Delco engineer from 1950, I mean, I'd love to hear what he has to say about that. It'd be, he's, he's got a whole different perspective on this than we would, and it'd be fascinating to know. Anyway, uh, let's go see how this thing works. Okay, guys, here we are back out at the park, and you all know that means we're basically reached the end, finally, of this multi-part project. This thing really turned out to be a lot more than I anticipated, but I learned a lot on this. And we'll go through it all but first let me get everything started up and so you know I've got an antenna over here I'm going to slide it over to get a little bit further away from the equipment and uh, we got the power supply we got voltage current and the radio we got my homemade speaker enclosure here which helps and uh, let me just go ahead and get this started up and we'll talk about it while it's warming up okay so let's get this going voltage current I can't tell if you can see that okay, but we're about uh, four and a half volts, five volts, six volts. Conduction starting. Okay. Over to CJ Stroud. Just want to point out to you that uh, somebody will probably remind me of that following next Thursday. Okay, let me uh, zoom in on the radio here just a bit. 
since you see what my setup is. Okay, now we can see it okay. So yeah, let's just uh, run through the bands here real quick. There's a station I can barely pick up at the house. So out here at the park, we really get away from all the interference of being inside the house with lots of modern electronics and power supplies and so forth. So let's do a quick look through here. Just can't get away from all interference. To get your free garage door inspection, there's no obligation. Just call now, 281 3 4 Now, you know, a set 5%, 5% of what we started with before the crash. Here, unless you completely tank the season and you've got an opportunity for Drake. Public because of operation. I'm appointing my best to work. Right now, watching your investments. You must sleep sometime, and at least. We're atoned for. Remember. And visit. Because. More airtime was given. Less experience. The push buttons work great. If you're rushing to a teammate's defense, it's still or someone is. I mean, there's always going to be happened. Hypothetical. Our vehicles, they're they're fully wrapped. Now guys, I'm out here in the sticks, okay, so that's a lot of stations to be picking up. This has got to be probably one of the hottest radios I've, I've, I've worked with. It's got the, the RF amplifier stage in front that really helps, and uh, it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful example of a car radio or a radio at all for that matter. Let me just kind of talk through what all we've been working with on this. Let me shut it off. I actually had to make a list of the stuff that we dealt with on this thing. So it was sent in to us by a friend of a friend. Uh, and I think that he had gotten this from somebody who had restored it. Restored it. And we opened it up and we saw there had been a number of, of capacitors been changed. And so we went through and checked the transformer, make sure the transformer was okay. And uh, you know, it had continuity through it and wouldn't have any shorts in it. And then we started looking at the vibrator type power supply, which was necessary here because you got a six volt car. Once again, this is for a 53 Chevy. So it has a six volt battery. And of course the tubes need a couple hundred volts to operate. So it has a vibrator type power supply in there to get the power up, the voltage up. So we tested that out and experimented with it. And that was pretty cool. Then uh, found that we needed a new power supply that would provide more amps than the little lab uh, supply had. So we had to get that ICO battery eliminator you saw over there and had to rebuild it and we made a video for that as well and then we got to where we could power up this radio with all the tubes in it and then you know checked all the voltages and so forth the radio worked uh, we went in and looked at some of the capacitors we looked at some of the resistors changed a few resistors satisfied ourselves that the rest of it seemed to be working okay but we really had a hard time operating the tuning I was afraid it was going to break it the push buttons wouldn't work very well and you couldn't reset them so we went in and cleaned up and lubricated the tuning mechanism and got it to where it works just great now, as you can see. And we got that working. And uh, then we also replaced some tubes and looked at how they operated and compared power outputs on the SG-165. Then what we did was we took a solid state vibrator and we retrofit a solid state vibrator in here to replace the antique 
audible, you know, mechanical vibrator that was in here working. So we put that through its paces and found out it worked really well. So we mounted that in a tube base and put this in, uh, in a slot where it's removable and you can put it in or put in the old um, vibrator if you choose to. We went through and did an example of the alignment. I've since done the alignment a couple of more times since then, honestly, to fine tune this. Because it takes a long time to get it right. And, and, uh, but we got that done. Then what we did was we thought about what we had. We had the radio that was working, but I had a concern about whether there was a capacitor still hiding in that transformer. Somebody had done the restoration, but did they go in there and change that capacitor inside the transformer? And we had tar that leaked out, so there was some concern about what's going on here. So we bit the bullet, went back into this thing, took the transformer out, opened it up and found that capacitor still in there. So it had an original waxy, you know, paper capacitor in there that had all dried out and it fell apart. And it was very leaky. We tested it right before we took it out. And uh, so we're glad we did that. We got that out, mounted the transformer back in, cleaned up the chassis how we could, and then we found the right capacitor to put in there to, to uh, replace, if you will, the function of the capacitor that was in the transformer. And we found that just another 0.47 microfarad worked just fine. So that's what we did. It's been interesting dealing with the different schematics we've had. And we even found an example, I believe, of a typo that had to do with the, the, um, the cathode voltage on the, uh, on the RF amplifier. That was really kind of interesting. Uh, then what we did is this thing has a sensitivity control, which allows you to have a variable cathode bias on the IF tube. So when there did some experimentations, we did some... Uh, uh, plate dissipation power to verify that we weren't overdriving it and uh, so we checked out and got that set. I've got it set for sensitive because the fellow who owns this lives in a rural area so let's go ahead and make this thing as sensitive as it can be and that's how it's set and you think it, you can see it's pretty works pretty well. Um, then I guess one of the last things we did is we went in and we had bought a replacement set of tubes for this and the fellow who posted this set of replacement tubes on eBay I, I don't remember but I don't recall him saying that the replacement rectifier was a solid state rectifier. But the box was so labeled solid state. I tested it, found out there's a couple of diodes inside. I chatted with the guy and he was like, hey you know if you want I'll, I'll send you uh, a tube type. But we experimented with it and it seemed to be working pretty well. But I did some additional research on it. And, you know, there are some people that say you shouldn't leave them in there. I mean, Shango's a good example of a fellow who says, you know, don't leave them in here because it messes up the voltage. They're too efficient. The voltage will be too high. And then there's other folks that say, well, you know, what's their problem is that sometimes rec um, diodes fail, and they fail as a short. So I did a lot of research on that and probably went overboard, but went with pretty much the most conservative way you could do this. I changed out the diodes that he had put in there, which were 1N4007s, and I replaced them with some high-speed ones, some UF4007s. <clears throat> and then I also put in <clears throat> a resistor for each one. I put in a 220 ohm at 3 watts, and then tested out the voltages, and it seems to work really, really well. We'll let this airplane go over. Hang on. Yeah, so now uh, I think we've done uh, a lot on this. We did a lot more than I ever expected we were going to do on this, uh, but it's been very interesting. I've enjoyed working on this, quite honestly. I've had it for quite a while, and I've had it running for many, many hours, uh, and days, in fact, just verifying this thing is working good, and you see how sensitive it is. I mean, inside the house, I wasn't picking up that much, but you come out here to the park, and you can just hear the band is just loaded. Uh, so hopefully he'll enjoy this. I enjoyed working on this. I enjoyed you guys following along with me and uh, being around while we worked on this old piece of equipment. It's really cool, and I also appreciate all your kind comments. So with that, I'll say thanks a lot, guys. Take care.